Welcome to the Avenue Bookstore Podcast. I'm Anna Taylor. On today's edition, I'm chatting with the award-winning author and journalist George Packer about his New Yorker article, Cheap Words. In this fascinating piece of investigative journalism, Packer delves into the world of the online retail giant Amazon. In the article, Packer examines how Amazon is reshaping literature as we know it and highlights many of the issues behind Amazon's current standoff with French publisher Hachette. I met up with George Packer earlier this year at the New Yorker offices in Times Square, New York City, to chat about the effect that Amazon is having on the world of culture today. I began by asking George when he first started reporting on the company Amazon. I was assigned to write about it Uh, in the summer of 2013, but it took a long time to get going. First, I thought I was going to be writing about Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, and and Amazon suggested that I would be able to, and then suddenly I was not going to be able to. A very good book came out in that fall uh, about Amazon called The Everything Store. So the target kept moving, and finally, in the late fall of last year, I realized that what interested me about Amazon was the effect it's having on our culture. Mm-hmm. Not so much on Amazon as a business or on Bezos as a person, but on culture, books, newspapers, TV. So that became the focus. And there's a lot to say about Amazon and culture. So I, it, I ended up spending maybe three months reporting it, and then it came out in February. Can you tell us a little bit about Amazon's founder? You mentioned you didn't have an opportunity to speak with him directly. How does his personality inform the culture of Amazon as an organization? What most people note about him at first is how mild he seems, how nice a guy. He's sort of an everyman. He's not a stormy, you know, dictatorial Steve Jobs. James Marcus, who wrote, who worked at Amazon years ago and wrote a book called Amazonia, uh, described him as, you know, being like the opposite of the Napoleonic corporate titan. He's small. He's a little nerdy. But he is more than any other tech mogul I'm aware of, relentlessly focused on his business and on what it takes to do what he wants to do. He doesn't waste any energy. He's just a a model of efficiency, as Amazon is. In a quiet, kind of self-effacing way, I think he is furiously ambitious. And Amazon is just nothing if not an ambitious company. In your article, you said that you don't sign on for a job at Amazon. You you sign on to become an Amazonian. Yeah, they want you. They're, they're taking you. And there's a certain type of person who becomes an Amazonian. It's more the engineering type or the MBA type than it is the, the, the humanist. There was a an earlier generation of employees who were actually writing lots of copy for the website and reading and reviewing books and interviewing authors. And they're pretty much all gone. It's now run by algorithms. They, they have so much data, and we sh- we'll talk about data as the, you know, the key to their business, but they have so much data that they now have something, they've taken out a patent on what they call anticipatory shipping, which means something you haven't even ordered yet. You may not have even thought about ordering it, but based on your buying pattern and the buying pattern of people in your area, they've placed that item on a truck or in a warehouse so that it's ready when you finally realize what Amazon has already known, which is that you want it and you're going to buy it. It's incredible. Absolutely A little incredible. creepy, I think. For, for Bezos, when he started this organization, I think it was 95? 94, I think. 94. Was it because he loved books? I mean, what was he trying to do back in those days? I think he's a reader, um, and I think he... He cares about books, but books, you know, a love of books didn't drive him to create Amazon. He left a very successful career on Wall Street. Um, He was always a numbers guy and a a scientific guy. And he set up an online bookseller. And in my piece, I have a, a scene where at his first booksellers convention in 95, he's got a booth that says Earth's largest bookstore. And a guy from Kansas City with Earth's, you know, like second to smallest bookstore comes up to him and sort of challenges him. What makes you Earth's largest? And they have this 
conversation and Bezos says it's cyberspace. We have, you know, infinite capacity. And I think Bezos saw early on that the great competitive advantage of being online was in books because you had infinite capacity and there are so many different books, whereas there's not that many different kinds of shampoo. There's millions of different kinds of book. And he told the guy from Kansas City, our business plan is to build up our customer base by offering low prices, gather data on the people who use our site, and learn from that data how to sell them everything else in the world cheap. That's exactly what Amazon has done. He saw the whole thing 20 years ago, and he saw it in books, which are not exactly you know, a high margin, obvious choice for a very ambitious retailer who just wants to create the world's largest online store. I think it was a piece of genius on his part. People go into books because they love books. They yeah. expect to make a little money. They hope to survive, but very few of them think this is going to create, you know, the Walmart of cyberspace, but that was what Bezos wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And and books turned out to be exactly the right thing, partly because the people who buy them tend to have a fair amount of disposable income. So they're good shoppers to have on your on your site. Well, let's talk a little bit about Amazon's relationship with the big five publishers. So Hachette, HarperCollins, Macmillan, Penguin Random House and Simon and & Schuster. How have these relationships with the publishers changed over the last 20 years? Amazon came along in the 90s when, as usual, book publishers were in trouble. They're always in trouble. They're perpetual, you know, damsels in distress. And there's always some, you know, someone riding to their rescue who actually might have some sinister motives. And that's how I see Amazon a little bit is this, uh, you know, allow us to save your business. And meanwhile, we're going to take all your data and, and use it. So Amazon seemed like free money. I mean, it's they're selling far more books than they were selling, you know, through other means. The chains uh, were kind of a yoke around their necks. And suddenly here's this online seller out in Seattle who uh, seems to have a much more efficient business model and fewer returns. Publishers have to buy back the books that they don't sell. So it looked like a good deal for them. Mm. But pretty quickly, Amazon started squeezing them using its market share to exact more and more difficult terms, um, what is called co-op, which existed in the physical stores. It just meant you pay a fee to have your book promoted, to have it put on the front table. Well, Amazon took co-op, of course, in their case, it's on the website, the promotion is on the website, and drove it about as far as you can and began to get a deeper and deeper discount from the publishers in exchange for rather vaguely defined promotional advantages. But really, there's no choice. As someone at Amazon said, it's the price of doing business with us. And not surprisingly, some publishers began to think of it as a kickback. Today, the big five, um, some of them are paying on top of the 50% discount that they give to retailers. They may be giving Amazon another five, six, seven percent a smaller publisher another ten percent so it's a very big piece of of the value of the book and today the relationship as one publisher said to me is um we used to think of them as frenemies and now they're really just our enemies but <laughs> but, but they're enemies that that we can't live without and another yeah. editor said to me you know after i've just recovered from being punched in the face again by amazon i have to say I hope they stay in business. You don't want the father who abuses you to then lose his job. They're in this sort of dependent relationship on a powerful retailer and they've gotten themselves into it. They've, mm. they've made enough mistakes to bear a lot of the blame. And now it's a relationship that they can't live without, but that is kind of squeezing every drop of profit out of their business. And can you tell us a bit about the Gazelle Project? And that was something that Brad Stone in his very good The Everything Store found. It was a code name within Amazon for a project that involved pressuring the smaller publishers for better terms and for a faster rate of conversion to ebooks so that they could get them on the Kindle. The gazelle was the, you know, the, the weak, lame animal that the Amazon cheetah was going to run down on the savannah and have for lunch. And I think it 
bothered company lawyers enough that they changed it to something <laughs> like the small publisher program or something. Much but, more banal. Yeah, yeah, but it got out and it tells you something about the the ruthlessness of Amazon. Yeah. The fact that they they see the publishers more and more as rivals. Um, they were their suppliers. They still are, but more and more they're in competition with each other as Amazon has moved into publishing through ebooks. But that hasn't been a wholly successful venture for them, has it? No, this is something I looked at pretty carefully. Um, the Kindle changed the whole picture. Mm -hmm. It created this new wave of ebook readers and now it's like 35 percent of the book market is is ebooks and kindle mm -hmm. amazon had 92 percent of it until apple and the publishers got together and the ipad became the competition now amazon has 65 percent. it's still what any any other industry you'd say that's a monopoly but it's put you know a lot of pressure on publishers to move into digital publishing, and Amazon itself moved into digital publishing. It, it became it it started as sort of an empire of genre uh, imprints: mystery, romance, spy, Christian, you name it. They've got an imprint in in Seattle, and they're just publishing thousands and thousands of titles because the costs are so low, and they you know they don't really edit them. They don't do much of anything to them. They just put them out there on Kindle. And they have a self-publishing platform where you pay a bit of money and, and publish your own book on Kindle. So they've expanded this empire, but then they tried to do something even harder, which is to go to New York right on the turf of the big five publishers and start their own trade hardcover uh, operation. And it has been a terrible failure. They've published these kind of crappy, schlocky books. They paid way too much money for them. The memoir by a has-been Hollywood director, a how-to cookbook by this self-help guru, Timothy Ferris, did not do well. And the the general sense is that they failed as a trade publisher in New York. And it's because you can't just use your algorithms and your database to publish good books. You need human beings who have judgment and discernment. And the house has to have a character, it has to have a vision, and they don't have those things. So it sort of shows the limits of Amazon. Yeah. They're, they're great at selling things. I don't think they're great at creating things. And was it also because, because the booksellers were not so keen to be selling Amazon imprints on their shelves? That was the coup de grace. I mean, they were publishing bad books, or at least not publishing very intelligently. But the other problem was that they couldn't get the books into the bookstores because Barnes and Noble and the Independent said, why should we help you? You're trying to drive us out of business. And so the books had this phantom existence. And one writer, Ben Anastas, who, you know, he's a good writer and wrote a memoir that Amazon published. It was in a couple of his local bookstores, but he just, you know, his mother couldn't find it. He just knew that it hardly existed in the eyes of readers because it, it didn't have a physical existence. It turns out you still need to have a book somewhere that you can go and hold and find and talk about. Having it on the Amazon website or on the Kindle, it, it's, it has a sort of ghostly existence that for authors who care about that kind of thing, you know, it's not going to be enough for them. It doesn't translate in quite the same way. Yeah. The pride of authorship, like yeah, your book is a bunch of electrons. It just doesn't quite have that. If, if, if you still have your feet in that older world. Now, a lot of writers are moving into the newer world without a look back, and they're not going to mind that kind of thing. One of the, the stories that I was really taken by in your article was the experience of a small publisher, Dennis Johnson, who's the publisher of Melville House in Brooklyn, his experiences with Amazon. Can you tell us a, bit of, a little bit about them? Yeah, he set up Melville House after September 11th, 2001. He was told by his distributor in, I think, 2004 that... Um, Amazon, which at the time was maybe like 8% of his sales, wanted an extra X percent to continue selling his books. And he just said, absolutely not. That sounds illegal. And he talked to his lawyer and his lawyer said, yeah, that sounds illegal. There's something called the Robinson-Patman Act in the US, which from 1936, which says that suppliers have to give the same discount to all retailers. They can't discriminate. Amazon seemed to be asking for a bigger one. Well, 
that he, he took his story to Publishers Weekly, which is very unusual. Publishers don't like talking about <laughs> this. They don't like talking about their business. It was yeah. hard for me to get them to yeah. talk to me. Not hard to talk, but hard to get them to let me use their names. But Dennis Johnson yeah. has become this outspoken gadfly. And the story appeared, and that night the buy buttons disappeared from Melville House titles on Amazon.com. He couldn't afford that. That was, and, and now he can afford it even less because like all of them, he's become more dependent on Amazon. So the next day he said, okay, you can have your, your kickback as he, as he put it. But he became a, a critic. He saw that Amazon, as he put it to me, is turning books into widgets, selling them for the lowest price possible, sort of creating an, an impression in the buyer's mind of, of a very low value object and the same price no matter how good it is how long it took to write it how long how much production value it had etc so uh he's a he's he's he and and most of them are quite critical he's different in being openly critical i think it was actually one of his distributors that said negotiating with amazon is kind of like dealing with the godfather yeah you have the sense that they're kind of mobsters in khakis and and polo shirts. And in fact, <laughs> uh, I think after the Publishers Weekly article, but before he acceded to Amazon's demands, he was at the booksellers convention and a couple of guys in suits with Amazon tags came up to him and poked their fingers in his face and said, when are you going to get with the program? So this, mm -hmm. yeah, they're, they're very aggressive. They're so aggressive that one guy I talked to quit rather than be hated by all the publishers he was dealing with. He okay. had been told by his boss to renegotiate a contract with Oxford University Press that had already been finished. And he just said, we're not going to do that. And his boss said, yes, you are. No, we're not. Well, if you're not, someone is. And that right. was the end of his job at Amazon. And I talked to some pub people in publishing and they remember him as like being one of the most frightening people at Amazon. So like <laughs> this guy who's like the good guy who doesn't yeah. want to be the heavy had to do the corporate job for a while and people in publishing were sort of afraid of him. In your article, you, you write that the, the big question is really not just whether Amazon is bad for the book industry, but whether Amazon is simply bad for books. How bad is it, do you think? I think it's... Uh, you know, it's a complicated picture because what Amazon has done that's good is made it possible for people all over the world and in places where there is no bookstore for hundreds of miles around to buy any book they want and read it. So all kinds of out of print books and backlist books and hard to find books are now available and they're available to you if you live in, you know, in rural Arkansas or in the Australian outback or wherever you are. So Amazon has democratized the distribution of books in a way that no one ever dreamed was possible. But what they're doing at the same time, and they tout this as part of the democratization, they are pulling the value out of books to the point where it's hard now for publishers to invest money in sort of difficult to sell books. I'll tell you what I mean by that. A guy named Colin Robinson, who's also a small press publisher here in New York, OR Books, he broke it down for me. If you take the, the cover price of a book, Amazon gets almost 60% of that in their discount, as I was saying earlier. The publisher spends another maybe 15% on things like sales and warehousing and distribution. So that leaves 25% for everything you would normally think of as being the cost of a book, editing, design and production, marketing and publicity overhead, the author's cut, and whatever profit might be left for the publisher. Mm -hmm. So that means, as Colin Robinson said, you know, <laughs> Bezos, whose only role is to be in the middle of all this, selling the book and getting your email address, is taking, you know, the majority of the value of the book. And that is that and along with lots of other things, especially just the changing reading habits, the people in the age of the iPhone and the yeah. iPad are, are putting this downward pressure on 
on profits and on advances. Mm -hmm. Lots and lots of agents and editors said to me, a book that would have been signed up 10 years ago now might not be at all. Another book okay. that would have gotten, say, a $100,000 advance, now it might get a sixty or $70,000 advance mm -hmm. because we just can't afford to take those chances and to mm -hmm. sort of stand by a book that we know is not going to be a big bestseller, but is by a writer who we want to invest in over the long haul. That kind of relationship, which it, to me is at the core of book publishing and is necessary for good writers. Good writers need editors and marketers. Good writers should not be on Twitter all day long or throwing their book out there on the Kindle direct publishing platform. It's harder and harder for that kind of writer, what used to be called the mid-list writer, to be heard. And in that sense, Amazon is bad for books. That was George Packer speaking about his New Yorker article on Amazon Cheap Words. Packer's latest book is The Unwinding, an inner history of the new America, which won America's National Book Award in 2013. The Unwinding is published by Alan and Unwin and is available at The Avenue Now. I'm Anna Taylor. Thanks for listening to The Avenue Bookstore Podcast. Mm -hmm.